Mothers in Afghanistan are holding healthy babies in their arms. People in northern Uganda are pumping clean water for their families. And Christi Christians in India are preaching the gospel and seeing thousands come to Christ despite persecution. All this is only possible because of the amazing support of churches like yours. I'm writing to thank you and everyone at Clodenbloch Baptist Church for your generous gift for the work of BMS World Mission. Your church family is standing alongside the church around the world, and please do share our gratitude. Our friend Pratip D. heads up a team of evangelists and youth workers who serve the marginalized Karen people in Thailand with your church's support. He says, My brothers and sisters, thank you so much. It is beautiful when we work together, and because you work with us, we can do our work much better. Please accept our heartfelt gratitude to your whole church for their generosity. God bless you. That's uh, an email, um, a letter from Kang San Tan, the general director of the Baptist Missionary Society the, to the church here. It was a, a letter that has been emailed uh, around the church, and we just wanted to share it with you. I wanted to share it with you on, on this media here to encourage you, to, to thank you for your continued giving to the church, which enables us to continue giving to mission, and also to encourage you that, uh, as we heard in that letter, the mission of God is not finished. Lockdown may have curtailed many of our lives, perhaps all of our lives, but it doesn't hinder the, the advance of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the, the uh, advance of His kingdom around the world. Nothing, not even the gates of hell, can stand against His kingdom. And I want you to be encouraged to, to think that the work of God is continuing around the world, and His work is continuing within your life. L lockdown cannot stop the work of God within you. It, it cannot stop the building of the kingdom of God within you or through you. And one of the reasons that Peter wrote his letter to these dispersed believers was not to encourage them just to, to hang on until we get back together. You don't get any hint of that in this letter. Rather, this letter was, was written to see them growing in their knowledge of Christ, increasing in their understanding of who they are and what God has called them to do. This letter was written to see the advance of the kingdom through those who receive it. With that in mind, I want to pray for us before we come to this final main section in the, in the letter of Peter. So let me lead us in prayer, asking that God would use these words to continue His work within us. Let us pray together. Father, we praise You that what You have begun, You will finish. What you have started, you will bring to completion. Father, we thank you that you have begun a work in us through opening up our eyes to see the wonder of your beloved Son, our Redeemer and our King. Father, I thank you that you have called us to live our lives in pursuit of Him, in worship of Him. So, Father, this evening as we come around the Scriptures together, Oh, Father, would you be pleased to cause our hearts to burn within us as we consider more and more of Him, more and more of the nature of you, our loving and powerful God. Father, you are the one who knows all things, and you know the situation in which we are right now. And yet, Father, we recognize our circumstances can do nothing to quench the fire that you have kindled within our hearts. And Father, as we spend time in First Peter together, Father, would you use these scriptures like petrol being poured upon that flame that you might cause us to burn with greater passion than ever before for the things concerning your Son and His kingdom. Father, perhaps where some of us are feeling that our love for you is, is lukewarm, may this evening, Father, it become white hot through your word, attended by the ministry of your Spirit. Father, we do so many things to grieve and quench His presence within our lives. But in this moment right now, 
Father, we ask for a fresh cleansing of sin, for a removal from idols within our lives, and for a fresh filling of your Spirit, that we may truly excel in following after Christ, that we might live lives for His glory alone. Father, hear our prayer. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. We are in First Peter chapter 5, and I'm going to read from verse 5 down to the end of verse 11. And this whole section is, in one sense, about the strengthening of God in the life of the believer. And it may be that, that many of you are thinking, the one thing that I do need right now is the strengthening of God. What if that strengthening comes through the very gift of these verses entrusted to us by the Spirit Himself? So let me read these words to you, and then we'll think about them together. So First Peter chapter 5, I'm beginning to read from verse 5. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to His eternal glory in Christ, will Himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To Him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Rudyard Kipling wrote a poem entitled, If, and the, the very last line of it reads like this, then you'll be a man, my son. Uh, and that last line kind of reminds you of the, the kind of the idea behind the book of Proverbs where you have a, a father writing to his son or a mother encouraging her son, passing on wisdom with the longing that this, this child, this loved one, will reach full maturity and actually be wise. Then you'll be a man, my son. That poem, if, ends with that line, but it begins with this one. If you can keep your head when all others around you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, and the poem goes on, then you'll be a man, my son. If you can keep your head, he, he begins that poem in exactly the right place. We were thinking together on Sunday morning in our studies in Mark's Gospel, where Jesus has this opportunity to, in the most significant place on the earth, the most significant figure in human history, and He has this moment to lead the teaching, and it can be summed up with that phrase, as we thought about on Sunday morning, beware the scribes. And the point there, if you can remember, if you listen to that with us, is the scribes occupied the position of influencers within Israel. They, they occupied the public platform of teaching, and therefore what they actually shaped was the belief system of those who listened to Him. And what we find Peter doing here in this, in this portion of Scripture in First Peter is doing exactly, he wants to shape what we believe. Now, you could say he's been doing that all the way through First Peter, but in these verses from verse 5 down to verse 11, it's just stunning what he does. He encourages us to believe at least four things about God. He encourages us to believe four things that God does for us. 
and four things that God expects us to do in our situation, and we could say for God. So, four things that He wants us to believe about God, four things He wants us to believe that God does for us, and four things He wants us to believe God expects from us. You can call this either a 12-point sermon or a three-point sermon. And all the time, what Peter is trying to do here is is shape our thinking, to, to shape the very things that we believe. And he begins with what we believe about God. In, in verse 5, he, he makes a statement that goes like this. For God, so he's teaching us something about God. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, my, my question to you is, do you believe that? That God, the God of Scripture, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, He is a God who opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Do we actually believe that? It's easy to quote it. It's easy to, to say that we believe these words, but when you look around you in the world, when you look around you at those close to you, do you believe that the God who's in control of everything, and that's a point Peter's going to make in a moment, is the God who stands against the proud? The psalmist is left in this quandary in Psalm 73, and it's a psalm of Asaph. So, so Asaph is left in this, this difficult place where he's, he, he's sharing with you something of the turmoil that is going on within his heart. And first of all, he says this. He says, truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. This is what he believes. Surely the Lord is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. See, this, this is what I believe. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My, my steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant, those who were full of pride, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So he's saying, well, on the one hand, I believe that God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But I, I, I'm struggling with this because I'm looking around me, and I'm seeing people who are full of pride and wickedness, and they're prospering. He goes on to say this, they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. He says they're wearing pride like a, a prized possession, and they're flourishing in life. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heaven, and their tongues strut through the earth. Therefore his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches, all in vain. I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been stricken, and it seems like rebuked every morning. So here the, the psalmist is saying, look, I, I believe certain things about God, that he's, he's good to those who are pure in heart. He, he, he could say using First Peter that he, he gives grace to the humble, and he opposes the pride. This is what I believe, but I look around me, and I see something altogether different. It does not seem to be that God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. In a world like ours, where those who are full of pride seem to flourish, Christian, do you really believe that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble? 
This is what Peter wants to set in our, our belief system. Our God is the God who opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Second thing that Peter wants us to understand and believe about God, and it's a beautiful phrase, and and it's found in verse 10. After you have suffered a little while, now here it comes, the God of all grace. So first of all, our God is the God who opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. And secondly, our God is the God of all all grace. Do you believe that? Let me tell you a a story. It's not a true story. There's a a very small fish who lives out in the Atlantic, right in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And if you wonder where the Atlantic is, if, if America's over here and the United Kingdom is over here, this wee pond in the middle is the Atlantic Ocean. It is huge, and it goes all the way down past Africa, down down that end, and all the way up the top there. It's just ginormous. I have have been now, I do watch sailing videos, and one of the things I would love to do is sail across the Atlantic Ocean. The, The problem is it takes like 28 days to sail across the thing. It's just humongous. But in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean out there, there's this little tadpole, and we'll, we'll call him Bob. So there's, there's a, a tadpole in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean called Bob. And this tadpole is a little bit concerned. It keeps worrying about the fact that if it actually inhales, drinks in some of the Atlantic Ocean, it's frightened it might exhaust all the water in the Atlantic Ocean. If you were to counsel that tadpole to tell him not to be so daft, he's not going to drink all the water in the Atlantic Ocean because he's just a little tadpole. I think we'd probably need somebody with more expertise than you if that's the depth of the insanity of that tadpole thinking it could actually exhaust all the water in the Atlantic Ocean. It's daft, isn't it? Our God is the God of all grace, inexhaustible grace, grace that never, ever runs out. One of the lovely teachings about God in Scripture is that He is everywhere present at once. He's huge, and we're told in Scripture that He is full of grace. You know what that means, Christian? God's grace toward you will never be exhausted. There is more grace in God for you right now. It's available for you. Any notion that somehow or other you've exhausted the grace of God shows that you do not understand who God is. Our God, the God who gives grace to the humble, is a God of all grace, inexhaustible grace, a grace that will never run out. If you think that maybe in the past you deserved the grace of God, and at this present moment in time, because you've fallen so far short on so many different levels, maybe you don't deserve the grace of God, I would suggest to you, you simply don't understand the very nature of grace. We never deserve the grace of God. Christ has earned grace for us which means grace for us is a free gift. When you first received it, you didn't deserve it. Right now, we don't deserve it. In the future, we don't deserve it, but Christ has earned it for us, so it's a free gift based on the mercy of God. So our God is the God who opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Our God is the God of all grace, And then one other thing that we're told here is, look at verse 6 there. It speaks about the mighty hand of God. So, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. And then the same word mighty is used there in verse 11 again, where it's translated dominion in my translation. To him be the dominion forever and ever. 
amen. Now, verse 11, it shouldn't really be understood as a prayer. It's more of a, a statement, which one commentator said should probably read like this. To God belongs all power or ultimate power. The word for power, both in verse 11 and verse 6, is kratos. And in every instance in the New Testament, with one exception, it's only ever used for the power and the might that resides within God. There's other words for power that some of you will be familiar, like dunamos. That's, that's used for power in people and different things. But kratos, in every instance, with one exception, is only ever used of God. Now, obviously, when I say there's one exception, we're all thinking the same thing. Well, what's, what's the one exception? And the one exception is where it's actually used to refer to something that the devil held within his hands. And it's spoken of in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14, I think it is, where it says that Jesus came to destroy the one who has the kratos, the power of death. That's the devil. So, the, the one piece of kratos that the devil held was taken back when Christ destroyed that portion that he had. So now all kratos, all power, all might, all dominion is with God. He has dominion, therefore, over everything. He has power over everything. This God who opposes the proud gives grace to the humble, who is full of grace, inexhaustible grace, has complete dominion and power over everything. There is not a person or a molecule outside of His control, not even a pandemic. That means we all have to stay home. He's in control of everything. If we believe that, it should change the way we behave in the midst of the situations that we find ourselves. And then fourthly, the fourth thing, that, fourth thing that Peter wants to teach us about God is, it, it can be summed up quite simply, even although at times this is one of the biggest things that we struggle with, God always does things at the right time. He's never late. He always does things at the perfect time. See in verse 10, it speaks about suffering and then says, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, and it speaks about him beginning to work. But that little while is exactly the length of time that God wants it to be. It's not a minute longer, and it's not a minute shorter. Earlier on in verse 6, we read this, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time He may exalt you. And there's this lovely allusion here in this verse that we may miss initially until you allow a, a backdrop of the Bible story, biblical theology, to start informing our thinking on this. This idea of a mighty hand is found frequently in the Old Testament, in particular in regard to the Exodus when God brought His people Israel out of Egypt. And we can only imagine what the suffering must have been like for them in Egypt, and how often the cries and the prayers ascended to God saying, how long, O Lord, before you bring deliverance for us? Are you hearing us, God? These Egyptians seem to be prospering and growing, and we're being crushed into the earth. Oh God, please save us. And what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 21, it's, it's the language that it uses that resonates in 1 Peter uh, chapter 5 and verse 6. So Deuteronomy 6 and verse 21. I'll read it to you, and if you're looking at 1 Peter 5 and verse 6, you, you see where the common crossover is here. 
We were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And in verse 6, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, and at the proper time. So, so what Peter's saying is, yes, we, we may be suffering right now, but our God is the one who has the mighty hand. He has the kratos, all power. He's sovereign. And the people of Israel were not in Egypt for a moment longer than God wanted them to be. They didn't suffer for a moment longer than God had decreed that they would. Now, I'm not just saying that to make it fit in with verse 6. We know that because when God was speaking to Abraham long before they ever went into to, um, slavery in Egypt, God was very clear with Abraham. He says that the people are going to suffer persecution for 400 years. Now, this is 30 years before um, Ishmael begins persecuting the promised child. And what we read is that when people, when the Egyptians, when the Israelites came out of Egypt, they had actually been persecuted for 400 years when you do the maths. So, God wasn't early and He wasn't late. His timing was exactly according to His will. And He does that because He has the power to effect His will. So, if we can believe that our God is the God who opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble, that His grace is inexhaustible, that He is the one who has all power and authority. He is sovereign, and nothing happens out of His control. And His timing is always perfect. It's never early, never late. It's always at the proper time according to His will. Then surely these beliefs should enable us, regardless of what anyone else is doing around about us, or what anyone else is doing to us, to keep our minds resting in the peace of God. But Peter here is not just telling us four things to believe about God, now, what he actually also does here is he, he tells us four things that God does for us and is doing for us. The first one is this. He has called you, verse 10, halfway through, speaking about this God of all grace, who has called you to His eternal glory in Christ. One of the things that causes me to worship is when I remember that it wasn't me who chose God first. It was God who chose me. That creates in me a sense of wonder and amazement and worship. I imagine that you are the same because we ask this question, well, why? It takes us back to chapter 2 in Peter. We're speaking about Christ as this cornerstone. He was precious and chosen, and we would say yes. But then he applies that to us. Likewise, you. And we think, well, how can God see anything worthwhile in me? And, and why would he choose me? And yet, what has God done? He has called us to his eternal glory in Christ. I always think it's, well, it's a mixture of things. It's, it's delightful when you see children with, with a new presence. It's not just kids. It's all of us. Something new, and, and they've wanted for ages, and they have it, and the excitement that they have, and you're just overjoyed for them, and two weeks later, it's pushed to, pushed to the side. It's like it was never really there. That the glory of this thing, you, you, you savor it for a moment, and then it just seems to lose the value and the attraction that it held. One of the, the problems that we have on account of sin is that we place value on things which are not really that valuable, and we undervalue things which really are 
valuable. It's one of the tragic consequences of sin in the human heart and mind. What I mean is that things and stuff are placed as more valuable than people who are made in the image of God. It should never be like that. Or or people are valued more than God Himself in whose image they've been made. It should never be like that. What God is saying here is, Christian, He has called you to His eternal glory in Christ. And the thing about the glory of God is it never, it never loses its appeal, its attraction. You only ever discover more of it. And in eternity, we're going to be more in awe as time goes on, if it's lawful to say that, than we were at the beginning. It's like the first day in God's presence is going to be, this is unbelievable. And the second day will be more in awe because His glory is glorious and eternal and is more wonderful every single day and will be more filled with joy as day gives way to day. And it's just ever-increasing joy and wonder in the presence of God. And part of that, we, we get moments now, like foretastes, because the kingdom is, is already but not yet. It's broken in but not in all its fullness. And God has called us to that. We, we stand amazed that He would. Me, you've chosen and called to share in this. This is what our God has done for us. And the second thing to note here about what God does for you and is doing for you, and what I would say is, if you take nothing else from this study, please take hold of this. God cares for you. I have no doubt that there will be moments in your life which you can remember, or or maybe you're in one right now, where the, 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 the thought pattern spinning through your mind goes something like this, does anybody care? Is anybody really concerned? Is anyone interested? It doesn't seem that they are. Let me read to you the final words in verse 7. I'm not making them up. I'm just reading them off the page. Speaking about God, Peter says this, He cares for you. And the word that's translated care means to care, to be concerned for, to be interested in. Here Peter is saying, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ And what you need to add is the backdrop. So behind him is the blood-stained, blood-splattered cross of his beloved Son, which proves his love for you. Did you not see how much God loves you that he would give his only beloved Son that you might be saved so that when he calls you, everything has been done to deal with our rebellion? And here is God the Father with the blood-splattered cross behind him, saying to you, Christian, do you not see, do you not understand, I care for you. I am concerned about you. I am interested in you. And that goes into every sphere of your lives. God's interested in the relationships around you, especially the ones that are broken. God's interested in the various different things and the problems that you find yourself in. He cares when you're brokenhearted. He's concerned when you're anxious and worried, as we'll see in a moment. He cares for you. If you, nothing, if you take nothing else, remember that one point from the end of verse 7. He cares for you. The third thing that God is doing is this notion, 
He will exalt you. End of verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you. Now, that may be soon. It may be within the corridors of time. Or it may be later. It may not be within the corridors of time. You may receive your exaltation before the throne of God. Now, humility is that state of heart where we're saying, I'm entrusting my case to God, and I'm going to allow Him to choose the proper time to exalt me. See, that's, that's true humility. If we're running around with this notion of, I want God to vindicate me now, that's simply pride. Humility is entrusting our case to God, saying, I believe you will exalt me at the proper time. I believe vindication will come at the proper time. Your will be done. I read a, a great quote this past weekend, the sentiment of which I, I've tried to sum up in this, this statement. It goes like this, true faith and trust is the willingness to await vindication before the throne of God on judgment day. The man who can wait until then is exhibiting the truest faith in God. He will exalt you at the proper time. Fourth thing, and each one of these deserves a sermon on its own, and this is found at the end of verse 10, where he's speaking about this God of all grace, and it says, He Himself, this is not something that's put out to secondary agents, He Himself, this is what God promises to do, will restore, will confirm, will strengthen, and establish you. He's going to do this Himself, restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Aren't these promises about what God does toward us and does for us? Just astounding. When you may be thinking, I I'm not going to have enough strength to see out the weak, do you hear the promise here? God Himself will strengthen. Give us enough strength to see our way through today. He gives us enough grace for today, because today contains enough troubles of its own. And if we simply can able, be able to live in today, we will receive the grace and the strength that we need for today. God has promised, and His timing is perfect. Finally then, and I will rush through these final four points, what does God expect you to do, Christian? We've seen four points about what we should believe about God, four points what we should believe God is doing for us, and then four points God expects from us. They are these, one, two, three, and four. One, cast all your anxiety on Him. Why? Because He cares for you. Number two, humble yourselves. Why? Because God gives grace and exalts the humble. Number three, wait, sober-minded and watchful, and number four, firm in your faith, resist the devil. Cast all your anxieties on him, humble yourselves, wait sober-minded and watchful, and firm in your faith, resist the devil. The key point here in this fourfold calling for us in these verses is to trust, is to be firm in our faith. You see, we have an enemy of our souls who is spoken of here in verse 8, that your adversary, the devil, who's prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. 
And what happens is in the midst of troubles that are happening around about us and various cares and and anxious thoughts that arise within us, the devil joins in with our own troubled mind and starts presenting things like these. Does God really care for you, Christian? It actually seems like he's abandoned you. I mean, you've been praying and it doesn't seem like he's answered you. Maybe there's no more grace for you in God. Maybe you've exhausted it. Do you see how you've fallen, Christian? Do you see the filthy rags that you're wearing, stained with your sin, Christian? And it's not like we need the devil's help. We're perfectly good at thinking these thoughts ourselves, but our adversary is seeking to destroy us in the midst of the circumstances that we find ourselves in in our lives. Now, the way to overcome him, the way to resist him, is to be firm in our faith, remembering that our God is the God of inexhaustible grace, remembering that our God opposes the proud, but promises grace to the humble. And in his proper time, because he's never late, He will exalt us because we know that He has all power. So firm in what we believe about our God, we resist Him. Sober-minded and fully awake, remembering that it is through suffering, as we learned earlier in 1 Peter, that our faith is tried and proved to be true. And through suffering, that we actually get victory over sin, which comes before exaltation. So, we're guarding our minds with these thoughts. And finally, verse 7, casting all our anxieties on Him. Now, this here is a command of Scripture. It's not a suggestion. It's a command cast all your anxieties on God, remembering you do this because He cares for you. He's interested. He's concerned. Uh, And my final comment here, my final encouragement, exhortation to you, Christian, do this. Actually, get alone with God and take all the anxieties which are burdening you and weighing you down, and share them with your heavenly Father. For those of us who have been blessed to have parents who actually cared for us and were interested in us and concerned for us, we know the blessing when you can turn to your parent and share your troubles with them. Well, here we have God the Father, all-powerful, who cares for you so much, exhibited in the cross of His Son, who's concerned about you and interested in you, and has grace which is inexhaustible. And what we're being encouraged to do here is to turn to Him and to take our anxieties and cast them onto Him, share them with Him, speak to Him like a child with a father knowing that He is the one who has all authority and His timing is always perfect. So remember, Christian, He cares for you and take your anxieties and cast them upon Him. Let me pray for us as we do that together. Let's pray. Father, we stand amazed once again, at your love for us, just at the thought of your work in our lives, opening up our eyes, unstopping our ears to hear the call of the gospel, calling us to your eternal glory in Christ, foretaste now and the fullness to come when we see you face to face. Father, that you would call the likes of me, that you would call the likes of us. We stand amazed. 
that you would be concerned and interested, that you would care for what's going on in our lives, in our families. Father, again, we stand amazed. Father, would you help us to be like children with a loving father? Would you help us to take the things that we're worried and anxious about and speak to you about them, to share them with you, our all-powerful God? Father, if for any our relationship with you has become distant, Father, forgive us, and in tender mercy, draw your children afresh. Renew in them that joy and deep, deep love. Shed it abroad in hearts by your Spirit, I ask. In Jesus' most precious name, amen. I can only really think of one song which seems appropriate Um, to go with this portion of Scripture. It's kind of the newer version of the song, but we'll put the link up here in the corner. Thank you.